The Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to Second Church on this second Sunday after Epiphany. As we begin our journey through another green and growing season, we gather in the revealing light of Christ. Called by God to this place and time, we join together with the entry at Open Unto Me, as printed in the bulletin. Please join in our responsive call to worship as printed in the bulletin. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. The light no darkness can overcome. Jesus Christ is the living word. Through the word, God brings salvation. Jesus Christ is the living water who has come through the life of the world. Jesus Christ is the great table host. At the table, we commune with Christ and his power. Our gathering hymn is number 730, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together.
to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be the saints, together with all those in every place, call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And together, God's people say, Amen. Amen. Hear these words from Psalm 40. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Happy are those who make the Lord their trust, who do not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after false gods. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. Were I to proclaim and tell of them, they would be more than can be counted. Sacrifice and offering you do not desire, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I say, here I am, in the scroll of the book it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. See, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your saving help within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from my great congregation. Do not, O Lord, withhold your mercy from me. Let your steadfast love and your faithfulness keep me safe forever. We come to the God of steadfast love with our prayer of confession, knowing that God is always ready to forgive. Let us pray. Mothering God, we have chased after foolish things and spent our strength on vanity. Our labor has been in vain. Deliver us from arrogance and forgive our self-concern that we may find our reward with you as servants of your dream. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Beloved, you are forgiven in Christ, the Lamb who bears our sin. Happy are those who put their trust in God and delight to do God's will. For God makes our footing sure upon the rock of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. Please share a sign of the peace of Christ with those around you. I'd love to invite any children or those young at heart to come and join me up front. Remember, you're going to sit this right here on the floor. Yeah. I did, sorry. <coughs> come on over, friends. Find a seat on the floor. Come on, Penny. You want to sit by Greta? No? Okay. Well, we'll sing. You come over if you want to. Um, we are singing This Little Light of Mine. 
I still didn't look up actual signs, so we just get to hold out our candle. Is it a flashlight? A candle? A candle. Okay, it's a candle. Um, and we just decided we're just going to use our voices and not have the piano with us, I think is how we decided. Um, so let's sing together. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This For my friends who were here last week, what has changed in our sanctuary? Yes, Oliver. Everything is green. Hmm, what does that mean that everything is green? What do you think it means, Simon? You forgot what green means. Oh. You've seen it before. What do you think, Oliver? What's happening? It's a growing season. Da, 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 da. What's this growing season called? The season after Pentecost. Nope. <laughs> Shoot. Epiphany. We are in the season after Epiphany. We talked about Epiphany last week. What's Epiphany about again? What happened? What do we celebrate on Epiphany? Ooh, we put on our Epiphany eyes, so we're looking for things. Uh huh. Looking for the revealing of light. We're looking to see what's up. For Magi, yeah, well, the Magi were looking for a star to, to find the, they were looking at a star to find the king. What king did they find? Jesus. Did you hear that first song that we were singing, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light? We were talking about looking for light and looking for Jesus. And we are going to hear a story today from the Gospel of John where some people see Jesus for the first time. And they call Jesus the Lamb of God. Have you heard that before? What does that make, Nass, no? What does that make you think of, Lamb of God? Jesus as a lamb. Hmm. That's kind of different, isn't it? Way different. Way different? Does it make you think of the Good Shepherd story at all, maybe? Yeah? Hmm. Hmm. And when Jesus meets some of these people, they're kind of curious. And do you know what Jesus says to them? He says, come and see. What do you think that's about? What does it mean to come? If I told you come and see, what would I be asking you to do? Look at something. Look at something. So you're going to use your eyes, maybe your epiphany eyes, to see what's there. And you're going to come with me, right? We're going to go together and see something together. So we are in a growing season. Ooh, like see a movie. We're gonna watch a Jesus movie. <laughs> We're gonna listen for stories about Jesus and wonder what's happening with Jesus. But our sermons in the season after Epiphany are gonna be from a letter to a church. What? A letter to the church in Corinth. Do you know that church? No. Hmm. Well, you're gonna have to listen and put on your epiphany eyes to see what you can see. Okay? Got them? Got your epiphany eyes? Yeah, can you can see Nora. Good. Yeah, see our friends, Lillian and Eliza, who came to visit us today. So nice. All right. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the light that you shine in this world that helps us to see. Continue to give us epiphany eyes and help us to be willing to come and to see what you are doing, what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in the church, what you are doing in this world. 
Thank you that you invite us to come. Thank you that you help us to see. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may go back to your seats or to Little Land. Our Old Testament reading this morning can be found in the prophet of Isaiah, chapter 49, picking up at verse 1. Hear these words from the book that we love. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you people from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord and my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him for I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength, he says. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to you to the very end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our gospel reading is found in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him. But I came baptizing with water for this reason, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, why are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. 
he brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cyphus, which translated means Peter. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So as Miriam alluded to earlier, for the next five weeks, we're going to focus our preaching by reading someone else's mail. Now, luckily, this mail was written prior to the U.S. mail code, so it is not a federal crime to open with and tamper with this mail. I hope that we are not tampering with it so much as just opening it. We're going to be looking at passages from the first three chapters of 1 Corinthians, a letter that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth sometime in the mid-50s. The letter attempts to address the divisions within the Corinthian church, divisions over the way people are acting, the way they are thinking theologically, the way they're treating each other, and more. Now, our preaching passages won't focus on all of these divisions, but they will be important for us to have in mind as we listen to Paul's admonitions and his encouragements. Today, we're starting at the very beginning of the letter. Now, for those of you who have read through some of Paul's letters, it might seem like skipping over the initial sections would be smart, right, in an effort to get to the meatier sections of the text. However, the openings of Paul's letters are quite telling. I was reminded of this in reading some reflections by Calvin Seminary professor Scott Jose. 
Jose compares the warm and gracious opening of a letter like Colossians to the more fiery rhetoric of the opening of the letter to the Galatians. After his personal introduction in Colossians, Paul writes, In our prayers for you, we always thank God. The prayers of it, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. So sort of this wonderful connecting point. Contrast that to the letter to the Galatians. Paul starts off, Paul, an apostle, sent neither by human commission nor from human authorities, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father. Paul is already clearly working something out there. And he soon says, I am astonished. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. One letter opens with warmth and a desire for connection. The other with clear admonition. And if you continue to read either of those letters, you can see that the seeds for the letter are planted in the introduction. So, what I'm trying to get at here is there is great depth in these introductory verses from 1 Corinthians. And these verses will be helpful for us to have in mind as we explore the early end of 1 Corinthians over the next few weeks. One last thing before I read the scripture. It's helpful, as always, to remember when reading Paul that almost all of the yous in a passage are plural. Right? Paul is writing to yous or yins or y'all or yous guys, depending on your regional dialect of choice. So we start in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place Call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and in knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the hallmarks of Reformed theology is the action of God. I'm simplifying things here a bit, so forgive me, Dr. LaRosa. It's intimidating to have a seminary professor in the congregation. I'm simplifying things here a bit, but in Reformed theology, it all begins with God. I've hammered this concept into the heads of those taking the profession of faith class. See, Sophie's already giving me a look into the, those taking the profession of faith class this year. Hopefully, all of your ears have perked up some, even you, Charlie, in the balcony running the video. God is the one who creates, redeems, and sustains us. God is the one who enacts salvation. God is the one on whom our life depends. Now, this might not sound like a radical concept, and if your whole life has been steeped in Reformed churches, it probably isn't a radical concept but it has profound implications for how we live our lives. Now, I won't be so presumptuous as to say that Paul was the first Reformed theologian, but Paul's influence on Reformed thought is undeniable. And passages like this one from 1 Corinthians are integral parts of that puzzle. Looking back at these verses, it's interesting to note that it is God who is the actor throughout the passage. Paul is called by the will of God. The church is sanctified in Christ Jesus. Paul gives thanks because the grace of God has been given to the Corinthians. Jesus is enriching the church in speech and knowledge. Jesus is the one who is strengthening, and God is the one who is faithful. All of these things start with the action of God. Now, why is this so important? What is reassuring or hopeful about the idea of God being the primary and first actor? 
And what does this reminder of God's primary acting have to do with the conflicts in the church in Corinth? For the Corinthian church, this reminder of God's action is an important corrective, beginning corrective, to their divisive ways of being. Many of the conflicts in the Corinthian church are driven by different factions claiming superiority for various reasons. Some are claiming superiority because of their spiritual gifting. Some are claiming superiority because of their material wealth. Some are claiming their superiority because they're smarter than others. Some are convinced of their superiority by virtue of some kind of secret knowledge of secret things revealed only to them. Now already Paul is cutting down these superiority arguments. He says, you are called to be saints together with everyone. And any gifting that you have received has come from God. It is not your own doing. He's not doing this in some vindictive way to try and cut them down at the knees, but rather he's reminding them to live in a posture of humility. What a gift of profound grace it is, he says, to have whatever speech or knowledge that you have. It is all a gift from God. Whatever it is that you believe makes you unique, he says, it is God's action first that makes you who you are. Now this can be also be a helpful reminder for us as we work out what it means to be a place like Second Church here in Zealand in the year 2023. We certainly have no, we certainly have a strong sense of who we are as a church, right? And we take no small pride in being who we are as a church. And it is important to always remember that we are who we are because of the graciousness of God. We haven't gotten here solely on our own doings or our own merit. We've come to be who we are over these last 119 years because of who God is. God, as the primary actor, is also important because it frees us, both personally and as a church, from the anxiety of striving to measure up, or the concerns of being worthy enough or good enough, or the worry of if we are even doing enough. God is the one who is moving. We get to join in that movement, but God's salvific work does not depend solely on us. God's going to do what God is going to do. Now, God certainly wants us to join in that movement, to find life and joy in that movement, but God's salvation plan for the world doesn't completely depend on Second Church doing everything for everyone, or any of us individually doing everything for everyone. But rather, God is calling us to be faithful to who we are called to be as Second Church. In verses 8 and 9, Paul shifts gears slightly to two ideas that will undergird many points in the rest of his letter. This idea that God will strengthen you, God will strengthen yous, yins, y'all, to the end, and that God is faithful. He's going to get into the weeds with some very tricky conversations in the rest of this letter. So he wants the Corinthians to understand this, that despite the hard conversations that they're going to have as a body, God will give them the strength that they need. And through all of that, God will be faithful. And when they hold these truths ever in front of them, they can be reassured that they can do difficult and transformational work. They can mend the wounds within their body. They can begin to heal the divisions threatening to rip them apart. Now, I don't think we're at that kind of point here at Second Church, right? I don't think we are here at that. But that doesn't mean that the truths, that these truths aren't something that we should hold ever in front of us. Because these truths are life-giving in the midst of things that aren't just about divisions and disagreements. These truths are life-giving in the midst of all of the ups and downs of life, both our individual lives and our corporate life. In times of doubt, we need the reminder that God is faithful to us, even when it feels like we do not have faith to speak of our own. In times of ill health, we need that reminder that God will give us strength, that God will be our strength when we can't carry our own self. In times of societal turmoil and uncertainty, we need the reminder that God is faithful, that God can heal divisions and mend broken relationships. 
when having hard conversations and leaning into difficult topics, we need to trust that God will strengthen us and remain with us while we do that work. Work that may seem too challenging or daunting, but we can trust that we do not do it alone. When taking risks to try new ideas or new ministries, we need to hear these words of God's faithfulness over and over again. Reminders that we are joining in God's ongoing movement in this world. Now these aren't just some ideas, some words from an apostle who died nearly 2,000 years ago. If there is one thing I know to be true in my own life, it is that God is faithful. I don't always understand it. I don't always see it in the moment. In fact, I often don't see it in the moment. I know that I don't deserve it, and I don't always have words to describe it. There's no good three-point, clearly reasoned argument I'd use to point out and prove that God is faithful. But I know that it's true. I know deep within my bones that it is true that God is faithful. If someone asked me to summarize my faith, I'm not sure I could do much better than that answer that God is faithful. If asked what I'd like the people of Second Church to know, God is faithful comes pretty close to summarizing things. That and that the world doesn't revolve around you, so you probably shouldn't be a jerk to someone else. <laughs> Friends, we are who we are because of who God is. We are who we are because of who God is. We can be who God calls us to be because God is faithful. We can take risks and reach beyond what seems possible because God is the one who will strengthen us to the end. May we, as the body of Christ here at Second Church in Zealand, strive more and more to believe in these truths. May they continue to shape who we are, both as individuals and as a collective body. May they encourage us and uplift us in difficult times. And may God's continued gift of grace be a beacon of light in a weary and hurting world. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, the meal that we are about to celebrate is a feast, a feast of remembrance of communion and of hope. We come in remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill for us all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. By his death, resurrection, and ascension, he established a new and eternal covenant of grace and reconciliation that we might be accepted of God and never be forsaken by him. We have come to have communion with this same Christ who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the world. In the breaking of the bread, he makes himself known to us as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us unto life eternal. In the cup of blessing, he comes to us as the vine in whom we must abide if we are to bear fruit. We come in hope, believing that this bread and this cup are a pledge and a foretaste of the feast of love, of which we shall partake when his kingdom has fully come, when with unveiled face we shall behold him, made like unto him in his glory. Since by his death, resurrection, and ascension, Christ has obtained for us the life-giving spirit who unites us all in one body, so are we to receive this supper in true love, mindful of the communion of saints. Friends, whether today you feel stronger than you've ever felt, or more faithful than you've ever felt, or whether today you feel weak and faithless, know that it is Jesus who invites you to come and to see, to come and partake in this feast feast of strength, of faithfulness, of grace. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Holy and right it is, and our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places. 
O Lord, our creator, almighty and everlasting God, for you created heaven with all its hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being and preserve us by your providence. But you have shown us the fullness of your love in sending into the world your son, Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh for us and for our salvation. For the precious gift of this mighty savior who has reconciled us to you, we praise and we bless you, O God. With your whole church on earth and with all the company of heaven, we worship and adore your glorious name. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once on the cross by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sin of the whole world. In the joy of his resurrection and in expectation of his coming again, we offer ourselves to you as holy and living sacrifices. And together we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray that the bread which we break and the cup which we bless may be to us the communion of the body and blood of Christ. Grant that being joined together in him, we may attain to the unity of the faith and grow up into all things into Christ our Lord. And as this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf and these grapes from many hills into one cup, grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Every time you eat this, do so in remembrance of me. In the same way, after they had eaten together, he took the cup and gave it to them saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for the sins of many. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. The bread which we break and the cup which we bless are the communion of the body and blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God given for us, the people of God. We invite you to partake in communion this morning by coming forward down the center aisle. We'll hand you a piece of, a piece of bread. You can go to either side to get a cup and return to your seats by the outer aisle. If you are more comfortable being served in your seat, please know that an elder is available to serve you there as well. Invite the elders to come forward at this time.
As we come before God with our prayers today, just a note that Marion Murphy's sister, Ruth, died on Friday. So our sympathies to Marion Murphy and her wider family as they grieve. Let us pray. God of purpose and promise, we open our hearts to you in prayer, trusting in your mercy to bear the burdens we carry. We thank you for the work and witness of your church, bringing your good news into many lives and situations throughout the earth. Today, we pray for congregations that are struggling financially, for churches caught up in conflict, and for all those church members who are tired and need your renewing spirit. Guide them with your grace. We thank you for the healing that comes from your hand, O oh God, in times of reconciliation when your forgiving love is at work, and in times when pain is eased and grief is comforted. Today we pray for those whose emotions are raw, for those whose bodies are weakened in this winter of sickness, and for any whose minds are troubled in any way. Give them hope for new life with you. We lift to you people around the world who work for justice and unity to prevail in the midst of division, in nations where conflict has broken out or repression rules, in places facing poverty, famine, or destruction from disaster, and anywhere racial and ethnic disparities weaken common life. We pray for our local and national community in this time when resentments simmer and differences deepen. Send your justice to bring relief and your peace to help understanding prevail. As the followers of Jesus, give us the courage to unite, not only in prayer but also in action for the needs of this world. Strengthen us to work together despite our differences so others may see what it means to follow you in Christ's name. And so we join our voices together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, again, good morning and welcome to Second Church. It's so good to be gathered here in this place with you. Certainly want to extend a welcome to all to stay for coffee following worship this morning. Um, we do have some second hour opportunities, and those are just a little bit different today. Um, because of our numbers of who's here today, we're going to do one Children in Worship Center. So same thing, we'll send you down in a little bit. You'll start with Feast, and then you're going to have one Worship Center together with Miss Melissa today, and you'll end with your music time. Fifth and sixth graders are upstairs as per usual, and our Profession of Faith friends are going to stick around with our adults today, because you get to hear from Pastor Eric, who's going to talk about his sabbatical that he took a really long time ago. It's just, just what, 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 what was that sabbatical thing that we did? Um, anyway, it's just how time works. So those are the second hour opportunities today. Um, wanted to draw your attention to the blood drive that is happening here in our building on Thursday. Um, blood shortages are significant right now, so if you are able to give, we certainly encourage you to do that here or somewhere else. Um, Year-end giving statements were sent out, and you should uh, receive those sometime this week. If there are any issues with your statement, please contact the office during our regular office hours. Um, as we shared in a letter last week, we have a new staff position that we will be hiring for, and we're looking forward to posting that this week. Um, and we need your help to get the word out about this position as we try to find the right person to join our staff. And then lastly, we have a second series event next Sunday at 5 p.m. 
If you have a place that you frequent that you can hang a poster, there are posters outside the office in the little cubby on the wall. You can grab those and distribute those. That helps us get the word out um, for those events. I think that's it for announcements to bring to our attention. We have gathered our gifts before God, and we now present those gifts to God. these gifts, O God, from what we have first received from you. Use them, we pray, to enable the ministries of this church to flourish as we together serve our neighbors, both near and far away, by showing love and doing mercy. Amen. I'd like to invite our children and their leaders forward at this time that we might send them on their way. What is our blessing? The Lord be with you. And also with you. Our sending hymn is number 876, God Whose Giving Knows No Ending. join in our ascending litany found on page five. Welcomed and fed by Christ at the table, we, we use our, our lives to serve God and our neighbor. Washed at the font, we, we witness, witness to a love greater than our own. Redeemed by the word, we, we marvel at the wideness of God's mercy. Enlivened by the light, 
we join in God's promise to make all things new. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.